Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Quantity Takeoffs with Bluebeam Review webinar today. My name is Alan Biermacher from Digital Drafting Systems. I'm our customer success manager here, and we're very excited to bring you this webinar today uh, about the Quantity Takeoffs with Bluebeam Review, managing unique markups, performing multiple cost analysis, and creating hyperlinked summary reports uh, with Ari Restman our uh, AC Technical Specialist and Bluebeam Certified Instructor. Let's go ahead and jump over to that next slide, Ari. So just some logistical information for everybody. Uh, all of our attendees will be muted during the presentation, and we'd love if you could participate throughout this presentation as you come up with questions. Uh, please send those over via the chat box. Uh, please also know that this webinar will be recorded for future viewing, and we will send that information out to you after the, the uh, presentation. So Bluebeam Review Training is also available. Contact us for more information on that. And uh, for any other questions, you can give us a call at 305-445-6480 or email us at info at ddscad.com. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ari. Thank you very much, Alan. Hi, everybody. Once again, I'm Ari. I'm a Bluebeam Certified Instructor, and it'll be my pleasure to show you all how to perform quantity takeoffs with Bluebeam Review. Let's go into the meat of the matter. Let's look at our overview. We're going to start off with learning about the tool chest and we'll learn about drawing mode versus properties mode. This isn't necessarily a quantity takeoff related topic, but it's going to help us get started and allow us to use our tools in the best way possible. Then we'll also look at how the subject line in our tools will affect our tools and how they're going to affect our quantity takeoffs and our custom columns in our markups list. And we'll look at setting some default tools as well so that we can have some tools ready to use very quickly. Then we'll look at our markups list and we're going to look at sorting and filtering along with creating hyperlink summary reports. And then we'll perform some fun cost analysis. We'll perform a cost analysis for our floor area. You can see in this image here on the right side that I've already taken a screenshot of what my markups list for some of our different items look like. So we'll get a floor area, we'll get a wall area if we want to, and we can also use different materials. And we'll control all of that through the program. So let's get started. I'm going to switch into Bluebeam Review itself. And let me show you guys, first of all, the tool chest. So we can find our tool chest by going to this little toolbox icon. It's right here on the left side of my screen. What I've done is in previous webinars, I've shown you all how to adjust your profile. So I have some tools on the left and some on the right. So you guys can do the same if you want to, if you're following along, you can use the review advanced profile as a starting point. So in the tool chest, I have some tools here and I can switch between two different modes. There's two different ways you can switch between these modes. If you're using a touchpad and you're not using a mouse and keyboard, then you would actually have to tap and hold with a stylus, or you can right click on top of any of these tools. And then you can switch to either drawing mode, which is found right here, or if the tool's already in drawing mode, you can switch to properties mode. So for example, I'm gonna switch this one. And now there's properties mode. The way that I switch it typically is I just double click on my tool. So if you're using a mouse, you can just double click and you can tell that a tool is in either mode based on the icon. So for example, this is an area tool. And if I double click on it, this is exactly how the area looked when I saved it to the tool chest. When I move my mouse onto my drawing, this is how it looked. This is the exact area coverage that I made. And then when I double click on it, and now I move that tool onto my uh, drawing, I can now create brand new areas. So this is called properties mode. I keep the exact same properties of the previous area. So I still have that same blue color, the same blue fill in the background. I even have certain labels turned on so we can see that it says ceiling paint and it gives us the square footage. So this is how you can use your tools in many different ways. And this is gonna help us perform our quantity takeoffs, not only in our markups list, but we can actually see the data right in front of us on our drawing whenever we need to. To control labels, we would actually go to our properties area. It's this gear wheel right here in the upper right. And all measuring tools have labels. Markups, however, do not have labels. So if I click on a typewriter, for example, right here, that label that was right in this area just went away. All we have is author and subject. I'll discuss the subject very soon. There's the subject once again for this markup. So I'm going to click on this area tool. There's the label once again, and I've decided to use ceiling paint as a label. It actually matches the material that I assigned to it down here. And the only way that I can use this material is by having the proper subject. So right now I have a subject called interior that I've used for this markup. And as a result, I can choose any materials that are associated with interior on this dropdown. 
Now this is getting a bit ahead of myself, so I'm gonna go into the custom columns and show you how I made all of these little criterion very soon. And let's get back to the tool chest. So now that we know how to use our markups in the two different ways, we can set all of our markups up for success. Now what I've done in my tool chest is, I have basically one or two of every single markup and I use these as an example. So I have most of them in properties mode. So how can I tell that it's in properties mode? Right now you can see the generic symbol for the tool right above it. So this is an A and a square, this is an A inside of a circle. So I know this is a text box and this is a typewriter. And if you wanna check and see which tool corresponds to what markup, you can go to the tools dropdown at the top of your screen, mouse over markup, and here's the full list of markups. So I can tell what a markup is based on the symbol right here on the left side. So if I double click on these markups, you can see how they looked when I created them initially. And so this could be useful if I wanted to reuse certain labels and certain markups. A good example of this is this markup right here. This is actually a sequence that I've created from a very basic set of letters inside of a circle. So this is where I began the sequence. This is C1. How I created a sequence was I right clicked on top of this, moused over sequence, and then I defined my sequence. This could also help with quantity takeoffs, and we're gonna see how we can manage different quantities and amounts inside of our markup list through sequences. So I've decided to start my sequence off by changing it through numbers. So I, if I want my numbers to increase or decrease, I will now use the first style, which is one, two, and three. If I want the letters to change based on the sequence, then I can go A, B, and C and use Roman numerals as well. Then I set my prefix, so C will always be before the letter, so I'm using columns as a designation, so it'll be C and then whatever number comes next in the list. We're gonna start at one, and we're gonna go up by increments of one, and I can change all of that. If I wanted to, I can use a suffix instead of a prefix, so I could, it could be one C instead of C1, but we'll leave it as it is. And something else that's really, really cool is this option right here, renumber when markups are deleted. So I'm gonna make a sequence and I'll show you how this applies. It's actually going to save us a lot of time. You can also choose how to renumber, whether it's by the entire document or per single page in a document. So you can control how this works in many different ways. I'm just going to use it by document. So I'm going to click OK. It'll ask me, since it thinks that I've changed some settings, if I want to rebuild my sequences, if there are existing ones. So I can say yes to this if I need to. It's not a big deal. That means that this number would change if there were more than one numbers, more than one of them on the screen. So let's go to my sequence again. And now I'm gonna place the next one. And automatically I'm able to continue placing these markups. The way that I'm doing that is not only by just using the tool in the tool chest, but I have something, a setting that's turned on and it's called reuse markup tools. It's right down here in my status bar. A little tip that I love to share at almost every webinar is how to turn on this amazing status bar. You can go to your tools dropdown, mouse over toolbars, and it's not on by default. That's why I wanted to share it with you all. So you can make sure there's a check next to status bar and it'll turn on this little bar down here on our screen. You can tell that it's open because I have some text that's giving me some instructions right down here. So because I have reused tools, I can continue to just place more of these sequence numbers on my screen. You'll notice that a little glitch is happening when I get to the double digits. I'll show you how to fix this right now. <laughs> so it's a fun little glitch. It has to do with the size of my text box. But anyway, because of reused markup tools, I'm able to continuously place this without having to click on the tool once again. And when I'm done placing them, I can just use the escape key, and now I'm done. Now, we got the double digits, and it looks like our second digit has moved to the second line. If I click on this markup, it looks like it's not wide enough. So a way to fix this is you can take this, make it a little longer by clicking on the square grip and dragging to the right, and then to auto-size it perfectly around your text, just use this auto-size text box button right here. Now we can fit the double digits. And what I recommend is, is that you actually save this tool into your tool chest. So the one that I saved is not large enough. The next number in the sequence, look what it's done. It's actually pushed the number down and the tool looks a little bit funky inside of the tool chest. So this sequence isn't really working very well. Let's get rid of this one. All of these are now independent. I'll have to make a new sequence, but this is good because this is how we make our sequences better. If we're expecting to make sequences of two digits, we'll need to make the circle big enough ahead of time. If we wanna have a sequence that's good for three digits, then we may as well get that prepared as well. But I think two is enough for my purpose. So I'm gonna add this to my tool chest. All I did was right click, mouse over add to tool chest, and then click on the tool chest. Here it is. Looks like the sequence still kept itself, so it didn't delete itself, which is good news for me. And now, if I continue my sequence, yep, everything is working as intended. The only problem is that we have some errors here. It looks like we have these circles that have still not fixed themselves, and they never will. So we should probably just delete them and remake them again. 
So this is a great example of showing what happens when you delete a number in the middle of a sequence. So this is C11, and you'll notice that C10, or excuse me, C12 is going to change, along with all the other numbers ahead in the sequence. Now all the numbers have changed themselves to accommodate the fact that C11 is no longer there. So now there's a new C11. And I'm going to delete this one and this one as well. And now we only have 13 numbers in this sequence. What a lucky number. Let's move these in a, some kind of an order, and that way we can see how they work. And now you guys know what happens. The sequence re will renumber itself as you make the sequence. It's quite useful. All right, and that's how sequences work. And this markup is a great example of using it in drawing mode, which I like to call carbon copy mode. It's an exact copy of what it was, but I'm using it as a sequence. That way it actually has some dynamic strength to it. It has some nice settings that will change as we create more markups. I'm going to use the select tool right down here, and I'm going to get rid of all of these, and that way we'll just reset the sequence. You'll see that the markup in the tool chest will change. What's nice, though, is that the sequence still will look quite nice, and what I've done is I've centered the text in the sequence, so even though I made the circle bigger to accommodate two digits, it still looks rather small. You can barely tell the difference. Here's the original circle on top of the old one. So that's all you need to do to make sure that your sequences can go up to two, three, or more digits. Just make your circles bigger initially and resave the tool in the tool chest. All right, let's go back to our PowerPoint and see what is next. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Let me explain how the subject works, and then I'll set some tools to default, and then we'll move on to the markups list. Let me go right there. There we go. So when it comes to the subject line, I'm going to click on a markup right here. And this markup has a subject called admin. And all I'm doing with this subject is I'm using it to sort out my markup in the markups list. So I'm going to open up my markups list. It's the three dots and three lines button right here. And now I'm going to see that admin is already highlighted. Sometimes your markups list needs to be open before you have a markup selected. So just deselect it and click on it again. And it'll make sure to navigate and highlight itself once again. Now you can see under subject that I have admin. And if I scroll up a little bit, we have a few more markups that are using the same subject. So I can use this admin subject to control what markups appear in this portion of the list. It's a great way to organize it. But that's only the tip of the iceberg, because now what we can do is we can use that subject to activate some custom columns. So if I click on this markup here in area tool markup, it is a subject of interior. Like I talked about earlier, this subject is now controlling which materials are associated with that. So let's look at that right now. And then I'll show you guys afterwards how we can set defaults. Just a little tip in, ahead of time. Here's the set as default option. It's at the bottom of your properties list right here. So let's go to our markups dropdown. It's the word markups list with this arrow, mouse over columns, and now let's click on manage columns. Here is where you can choose which columns are currently turned on in your drawing, but they're not necessarily showing in my markups list. So if I wanted to have them available to me, what I would do is I would check them off here, and then I would go back to the markups list dropdown, mouse over columns, and these columns in this list are the ones that I currently have available to me to use. The program has a few more that I keep off of this list because I don't want this list to be too big, but this list is flexible. Now I can turn things on or off very quickly. So if I wanted to see a volume, I can just check that on, and now we have volume right here, right before layer. So let's go back to the markups list dropdown, columns, and manage columns. And this time, instead of looking at the basic columns that come with the program, we're going to look at custom columns. This is where the most complicated and most rewarding stuff that we do today happens. These custom columns are awesome. And they don't take too long to set up as long as you know how they work. So I have four of them. One of them that's rather easy, and I'll just use this as a basic example, is responsibility. This one allows you to use a subject to di dictate who is going to be responsible for what markup. So how does it work? I'm going to select it and I'm going to click on modify. This is called responsibility and it is a choice column. We have different kinds of columns that have different criteria that you can use to control different dynamic assets that happen in review. So for example, I just use primarily choice and formula columns, but you could also use date and number and text columns, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a choice and I have several choices here. I have two admins that are using the admin subject, and I have three users that are using the user subject. And so what I've also done is I have a default set to myself. So whenever I make a markup, my item number, RER, will automatically be there made for that item. And you'll see that in some of the markups that I make if I make them from scratch. Let's look at this first one. So my subject is admin, 
I do not need a numeric value assigned to that. When we look at the materials column, we're going to see how numeric values allow us to perform really good quantity takeoffs. And I've set the default check, so whenever I make a new markup, there's my name. And let's look at one of the other ones. For example, let's look at this user. You guys might be familiar with Alan, who introduced me today. I'm going to modify this one. He also does not have a numeric value, but he does have a different subject than me. He has the user subject. He is not the default. So let's see how all of this plays out. So just keep in mind those two subjects. Those are the only things we need to worry about, admin and user. So I'm going to click on this markup here. We're going to look in properties. And right now, it just says text box for the subject. That means that this doesn't really have any special subject associated with it. It just sorts itself into the text box category in your markups list. And it's not really useful. So we're going to change it. We're going to call this one admin. Let's pretend that this is my markup that I'm making. So now that it's set to admin, what I did was I clicked outside of that box into another box, or I can click on a blank part of my screen just to make sure that the what I typed in solidifies itself. Because if you keep your cursor here, it's still there. Another quick way to fix that is you can just auto size your text really quick and then un -auto size it. Just make sure that you change it back to whatever font it was. Now I'm going to scroll down. Here are my custom column. Um, choices, and now we can look and see if the responsibility can be changed. It looks like it defaulted to me as the first one responsible. That's a good thing. If I click on this drop down, I can only choose myself and Varen. That's because we're the only ones with the admin subject. So the subject dictates everything. It is the most important thing you can use when sorting your markups. Now let's see what happens if I change this to a different subject. So I'm going to call it user. I'm just going to click on my font really quick. There we go. That's a faster way to uh, make sure that your um, data is input properly. And now let's scroll down. The responsibility is defaulted to nothing, so that's a good sign. Let's click on it, and let's see. There we go. Now we can look, use all, see all the three different users that are part of the user subject. So I can switch between Alan or Jim or Raquel. And there we go. That's how subject works. Now this is just responsibility, so this is still kind of climbing up almost halfway up the mountain. Let me show you guys something even cooler. Let's go back to our custom columns area. So the markups list drop down, columns, and manage columns. And here's custom columns. Now let's look at material, which is very similar, whoops, which is very similar to responsibility, but it's going to have even more power behind it. So we're going to select it and click on modify. Here this is also a choice column, but now I have numeric values assigned to all of my different choices. Let's look at interior wall paint, for example. We're going to click on Modify. I've assigned a numeric value of 2.5 to it, and also the subject is interior. So if we go back, I have about five different interior materials, and I have three exterior materials that I can choose from. So if I have the interior subject, then I can choose from these five materials only. If I have the exterior one, I can choose from these three. So we already demonstrated that in the last example. So these numeric values are cool because now they're basically multiplying by whatever unit that you're using. So if I wanted to calculate the cost of a, these, a square foot of wall paint, and let's say that a square foot is 2.5, then I can do that if the square footage increases. So now let's see how that plays out. So we have wall paint for interior and exterior, just so I can uh, ch show the difference between the subjects, and we're going to see how that works right now. So let's get out of here. And I will show you how the cost analysis works in just a second. Let me just show you guys how materials work first. So I'm going to click on this. The subject is already set to interior because I've used this before. I'm going to scroll down. And oops, I can now choose between the five different materials that I showed you guys earlier. And if I switch between the different material, you're going to see that the cost analysis for the floor or wall area are going to change. So steel has a certain numeric value compared to concrete. Now you see the numbers have changed automatically. And ceiling paint has a different numeric value along with wall paint, et cetera, et cetera. Here's Carrara Marble, a nice example from one of our clients. And now you can see how these cost analysis are already automatically calculating themselves. So you don't have to worry about doing any math. You just have to choose the correct materials and do all the math ahead of time. But there isn't that much math to do. Let me show you all the math that's necessary. We're going to go back to the markups list drop down, mouse over columns, and click on manage columns. We'll go to custom columns. And let's look at our cost analysis for floor area. We'll click on Modify. And here we can see that this is a formula. And when you choose formula, now you have a different set of options down here. So our options show an expression. How do the expressions work? Let's do this from scratch. 
We know that it's going to be material times area, but we can even go one step further and we can choose length, width, height, etc. And I don't even have to type in the entire expression. All I have to do is type in a letter. And it doesn't have to be the right letter because we can see all the variables in this list. So this is the best way to use these expressions. You want to use variables that are already in the program. But material is not a default variable. This variable appears in this list because I made a column called materials. So what I can do is no matter what material I have, the expression will be the same. And that's why the material column has made itself as long as I made a custom column for it and I made it a choice column. As a result of it being a choice, I now have the choice of using it in my variables. No pun intended. If we scroll down in variables, we can see that we even have constants. We have some little bit more fancy stuff. We've got pi, so 3.14, et etc., et cetera, and functions. So we have all different kinds of calculus and trigonometry functions. And if you guys know more math than I do, you can really go to town with this stuff. But I'm going to keep it simple. Uh, math was uh, a good subject for me, but I like to write more. So I'm going to be a little bit more flowy with how I make my expressions. So I just clicked on material, use the multiplication sign. And now let's do another one. So I could do area, but if area wasn't an option, then I can do length if I wanted to and width right here. You can even see that wall area is luckily there and available to us. If I didn't have that, I could do length times height. So there's many different ways of doing this. So I'm going to use area because it's already there for me. I changed my format from the normal one to currency. So now I can choose some kind of a currency symbol before my stuff. I'm choosing two decimal places. I could do more if I wanted to. And I'm using dollars. Sadly, not every currency is available here, but most of the major ones are in this list. We're going to include all of these calculations in our totals. This is going to allow us to get total amounts for calculating multiple different concrete areas or steel areas or whatever we're calculating as examples. And by the way, I know that I'm using steel as a very arbitrary example. You would never really make a steel uh, floor area in, in the way that I'm showing. Concrete is a better example. Let's look at the wall area and see how I made that. You guys can already guess. All I had to do is do material times wall area. Something interesting that happens is that it puts these brackets around the wall area. Let's make sure that that is the case. So I'll just tap it again. Uh, sometimes you have to double click in the list. Yeah, so it put, puts brackets automatically for you. So don't be perturbed if that happens. That is all very normal. It means that wall area is a special variable that is reliant on other uh, variables. While material, the one that I made, is kind of reliant on itself. <laughs> so that's kind of how that works. And we set all the formatting the same. So now we can calculate wall areas very quickly. Now let's actually make some areas and let's make some wall areas. And I'll show you how to make a wall area because it isn't as straightforward as you think. So let's make an area first. I can use any area tool. I could also use one in my tool chest. Let me double click on all of my tools to turn them back into properties mode because I usually make new data and I, and I just want to keep the properties that I used to use. There we go. Now all of these are back to their generic symbol. So here's my area tool. Let's look in properties while I have it selected and see if it has a subject. It looks like I've already set the subject for this one to default to interior. Let's change it to exterior while it's on our cursor. I haven't even placed it yet. I can even give it a label. So I'm going to call it, um, let's see, concrete area. There we go. And let me make sure that I click outside of that to solidify it. Yes. So now I'm going to make my area. I can just click and hold to make a, a rectangle. If I wanted to, I could also click and let go, and I can make an area of any shape like this. And then when I'm done creating it, I just need to press the Enter key, and it'll automatically finish the shape for you. So it's quite nice. So I made these two, two concrete areas, and now we can see the square footage here. If I click on this and I open up Properties again, let's scroll down in Properties, and let's see if we can choose materials for this. We can, because I've chosen the exterior um, subject. And what I've done is I've actually changed the tool in the tool chest itself because I didn't place it on the screen. I had it on my cursor. So you can actually change your tools in the tool chest by having your tools on the left side and properties on the right side. This is why I changed my profile from the default profile. So I can now choose concrete. Let's select it. And there we have our cost analysis already. So for 1,296 square feet, it'll cost us about 3,888 bucks. And we can see all of that in our markups list as well. Now, a wall area is being calculated, but that number is kind of silly. It's not really accurate. And wall areas don't really work with regular areas because they don't really have any kind of width. They just have a length and a height. So you can use the length tool to get a good wall area. So let's make that now. So the length tool, I have one right here that I'm going to use. 
the subject is admin. Let's not use that. Let's go back to interior, for example. Click in the label area to make sure that's solidified. And now we'll make our dimension. If I want to draw a straight line, I'm going to hold my shift key. That way I can draw in all four cardinal directions and in 45 degree angles if I wanted to. I'll make this about 25 feet. That's pretty good. Eh, 23 is good enough. And now all I need to do is choose my material. So my subject is good. So I'm going to get all the materials associated with that subject. Here they are. So let's say that we want to calculate how much it's going to cost to paint a ceiling, for example. So we'll click on ceiling paint. And there it is. Because it's a length, it doesn't even apply to the cost analysis for floor area. It immediately applies to the wall area. And there it is. We've got our calculation. It's going to cost almost 500 bucks to cover an entire wall uh, of paint. Why did I choose ceiling paint? I'm so funny. I have wall paint right here. There we go. <laughs> it's about I, I made them the same price. They both have the same numeric value. So it doesn't really matter what I choose. But I'm using either or in order to sort them properly in my markup list. So that's why I have the same or the same number associated with two materials, just for sorting purposes. So there's wall paint. So yes, it'll cost almost $500 to paint a, a wall that is 23 feet long. And wait a second, what's the height of the wall? So you can actually choose the height of any length tool by going to your measurements panel. That can be found here with this ruler icon. And here I've already set the height or depth, so to speak, of my wall to eight feet. So depth is the height in this program. So let's say that I change it. Instead of eight feet, let's say that it's actually a proper 10 feet. So I'm gonna type 10, click in the label area to make sure it's solidified. Let's go back to properties, but we don't really need to. We can just look on our markups list. Here, let's make sure this is the correct markup. So we'll deselect it and then reselect it again. We can also press the escape key to deselect, or you can click in a blank area. And there it is. We have this one highlighted. Let's scroll to the right. Let's make sure this is the one for wall area. I'm going to increase my column width. There we go. That's for the floor. So the wall area must be this one, the last one. And there it is. It is 599 bucks now because we have changed the height of that wall. So you can change your criterion very, very quickly by doing this. It's very, very easy. And that's it. That's how you can perform a cost analysis for your wall areas. Now, when it comes to sorting and filtering, this is where we need to get a bit more organized. Because right now, in my markups list, I have a lot of different kinds of tools that are associated with these subjects. But then, how do I organize them properly? Because now I have many different kinds of interior things that are lengths, and some of them are concrete areas. And so what do we do? Well, firstly, we can go to our markup system. We can use this filter icon here. So I'm going to click on this filter list. It is, in my opinion, uh, another name for it is the master filter button. This turns on filtering in general. Now we have these new columns or rows above our columns that say all by default. We also have this cool button that allows us to choose between saved filters. So for example, if I start to use certain filters and I want to save them, I can then save that filter as a certain name, and I can use that preset over and over again. So if somebody comes to me and quickly asks me, can you just show me all of the concrete areas? I don't want to see the other materials. I just want to see concrete. You can say, sure, and you can use the filter list, and we can turn all that on. We can do that by going to, for example, this subject line here. Let's click on all. And now we can choose between the different subjects. So if I wanted to, I can go to interior or exterior. Let's go to exterior. and now, now our subject is done. Now we need to choose between use a material as our other filter. So I'm going to scroll to the right. I'm going to go to my materials column right here. Let's make it a little bit bigger so we can see our materials. There they are. And now we'll click on that. And I can choose between different kinds of concrete. It looks like I have two different kinds. This must have been an old one that I was using. This concrete exterior I know is correct because I made this one in this column. And there it is. Yeah, it looks like this one that I made uh, before is a little bit uh, different. Oh, I see. I, I think I made this uh, very recently. And that has to do with the label that we used. So let's actually change that back to just concrete. And let's make sure that we have to click on concrete exterior to deselect it. So you can technically filter more than one item in more than one column if you needed to. All right. And there we go. It looks like it is filtering just this one has the concrete label and all the other markups have grayed themselves out. And now in our markups list, it looks like we just have this one item. What I can do is I can still click on other markups. And if I wanted to change them to this uh, other concrete item, I have a few ways to do it. I could go to properties and do it manually. I would make sure that my material is chosen correctly. 
looks like I have this concrete material chosen here for these. Um, another thing that I could do is I could actually match properties. So let me actually scroll here. Let me get rid of this concrete and let me actually turn on this concrete exterior. I want everything to be under the proper one, so we're going to use concrete exterior. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to use the Format Painter tool. So the Format Painter is found right here. It's a little paintbrush. If you don't see it in your shortcuts at the top of your screen, you can go to the Edit dropdown and it's right here. So now that I have the markup selected and then I click on Format Painter, if I move my mouse on top of any other markup that has similar properties, you can see the paintbrush icon is appearing whenever I do that. So I want this concrete area to be the same as that one, and then this one, and this one, and this one. Now, that has still not changed the markups. It looks like they're not appearing here. We can test this by unfiltering and then refiltering. And let's make sure. So what's missing then is, and this tells us that the Format Painter does not transfer all properties. It does transfer things like color and font size and the font color and things like that, but it doesn't transfer the certain things that make this different. So what do we do? We make sure that our subject lines and our materials are the same. So if the subject is exterior, that's good. And the material is concrete exterior. And this one, let's change our subject. It is exterior, that's good. And now the material, let's make sure it's concrete. And there it is. In our markups list, it's appeared. It's now colored itself up. And this is now part of the same criterion. Let's add one more. We're going to add this one. This is using the concrete interior one. It looks like the subject line is interior. So we change that to exterior. And then we click in labels, scroll down, choose our material, and there it is. Now we have three different options in our list. And now I just had to zoom out to refresh it. This now has color. So this is now part of our filtering list. When we're done filtering, we now have a few things we can do. Let's say that I only wanted to show the concrete items on my uh, summary report. I can now create a summary report and just show them. So before I do, let me show you how save filters work. You can click on save filters right here. I can give this a name, so I'm going to call it Concrete Exterior. Click on the check, and there it is. And now what I can do is I can click on Clear All, and then I can click on Concrete Exterior. And man, that was easy. I don't have to worry about choosing all those criterion and doing all the experimentation that I just did. So with that on, I'm going to click on this button right here. This is called the Summary button. This allows me to make a CSV summary, XML summary, or a PDF summary. So I'm going to click on PDF. And here we can go to filter and sort first. Now, before we do, just to let you know, the option that allows you to make a hyperlinked summary report is right here. It's called append and hyperlink to current PDF. So I always have this checked on because it is really special and I'll show you how that works soon. Let's go to our filter and sort column area. Here, it looks like all the filters that I've set are still there. So it is using the exterior subject. And if I scroll down, it's showing the concrete exterior for material. This is perfect. I don't have to worry about using this list again. But let's say that I don't want to filter anything, I just, but I just want to make a report with specific filters. I can do it all here. So I can change all of this if I want to within this dialog box right now. It's good now. So we're going to go to columns and make sure that all of our columns that are relevant are here. And let's say that we don't need certain columns. So we're just looking for the concrete area. We don't need volume, for example, so we'll get rid of it. And let's say that we didn't need the status, for example. So I'm going to get rid of that too. Now I'm going to go back to output, make sure that my settings here are good, and I'm going to click OK. It is only making a list of four items. I don't know why it said four. There should only be three. And that's funny. There are only three on the list. What I'm assuming is that the fourth item might have been just this top part here that is calculating all of our totals. So that's quite useful. We can now see that the cost analysis for floor area automatically has its total right up here. And if we look, the floor area for this one is 806, 3,088, 1,750, and that all adds up if I do the math properly. And the wall area one also automatically added itself up together. That's quite nice. You can have all of your totals at the top of your list, and then you have the specific items below it. And you can limit the amount of columns that are here to make this a little bit more concise, a little bit cleaner. And that way, you can have more items on your list at once. Now what's really cool is I've appended and hyperlinked my current PDF or my report list to my current PDF. So what does that mean? If I mouse over the icons of any of these objects right here, you'll see that my pointer changes to a little pointer finger. And it even has a little set of text that pops out. It's called snapshot view of floor plan. Isn't that interesting? What about this one? Same thing. That's actually telling me, without even have to, having to click on it, 
what page this markup is part of. So I can even just use the list without even have, having to click on this. But let's click on it for fun because I don't remember where I put this area. Oh yes, of course, it's right here on page one in this location. So that's what you can use the list for, to literally use it as a table of contents to navigate between different markups on your PDF. So if any, you can give this to someone and give them your PDF and say, here's the list of all the stuff that's relevant to what I'm giving you, and you can just navigate by clicking on things, and that's how it works. So it's really, really convenient and easy. I'm going to get rid of my filters, so I'm going to go to my Save Filters button and clear all. And I'm going to click on the Master Filter button just so I have a bit more space in my markups list. Now I got rid of that All row that was up here. And that's how the markups list and hyperlink summary reports work. Let's go into our PowerPoint again. I know that I want to show you guys how to set your markups to default. I know I showed you, but I, I want to demonstrate it right now. We did do the markups, and then we'll, we did some cost analysis as well. So we are nearly done. Let me show you guys how to set some default tools. So let's pretend that this area that I messed around with and I made, it now has the proper subject line. It has the product, proper material. Everything here is perfect. I want this to be my default tool whenever I use the area tool. Sometimes it's cumbersome to have to click in the tool chest and use a tool from here. And sometimes we want to make use of the tools up here in our shortcuts up here. The problem with these tools is that you can only have one kind of tool associated with the button. So here's my area tool right here. And when I use it right now, it's going to make the generic area that has the red coloring and the red border. There's no fill. And it, has, it is actually a nice area tool to use. It's quite easy to see. But let's pretend that I really, really liked this area and I want to use this as my default. So all I have to do is I can right click on the markup and I can set as default or in my properties list, I can just scroll all the way down and set as default is here. When you do this, nothing seems to happen. But if we use the area tool once again, we can even see in properties that it already has the correct coloring. And there's my new area. And now whenever I click on this tool right here, I will always get the default one that I set. So that's how you can use your defaults to make things faster. There might be a tool that you use most of the time. And once in a while, you'll have a special tool that you'll need from your tool chest. Now, the only issue with using the area from here is that it's always going to be a brand new area. So this is always, we can consider it in properties mode, so to speak. But that's fine. You can use these tools in properties mode, and you can use some of these in carbon copy mode. And that way, you can have labels, and you can have different presets ready to go immediately. And that, I believe, is most of the topics that I want to talk about today. Let me show you guys one more thing that's going to help to perform some more quantity takeoffs. I know I might have covered it in previous webinars, but I think it'll be useful. We're going to look at search and visual search, and that way we can find certain assets in our drawing without having to look at them with our eyes. Another thing we can use this for is not only to find markups, but to find actual groups of symbols and lines on our drawing. So let's use it right now. It's a little search icon right here. It looks like a magnifying glass. And the first tab up here is for text. It's very simple. You can type in any text. You can choose whether you're searching for markups or not with this option right here. And you have a few other options that you can check on. Let's say that I don't want to search for markups because markups are relatively easy to find. We can use our markups list for that, so we don't have to really look for those. But let's say that I really wanted to make sure and check how many different storages we have on this sheet. So I'm going to type in the word storage. And then I'm going to click on search. Some results were populating very quickly down here. Because I'm only searching on one page, the search performed rather quickly. And there it is. We have these results right here, four different results. If I select a result, it doesn't really zoom in on it. It does highlight it, but you'll see that there's a little bit of a quality of life issue as I continue to cycle between them. The third result was not on the screen. So as soon, what it did was it moved my screen to get there, but then it made a gap in between the edge of the screen and the result. And then it just highlighted the result and left it there. So it doesn't really center it on, on it and do it what you would expect. The hyperlink summary report will always center on your markup and zoom in on it to a certain extent so you can see the full extent of it. So this is why you don't want to rely on this search to find things repeatedly. Instead, you can turn this very basic search into something much more complex. You can use the select all button right here. This selects every single option that we just got from our search. And then we can click on this lightning bolt icon right here. This gives us a lot of different options. We can turn every single storage, the word storage, into a hyperlink. So if somebody clicks on that word storage, it could take them to a web page. It could take them to another page, an area on a specific page. It could take them to a page that describes how the storage is made, for example. So you can link to shop drawings through this tool. 
Then you can also mark it for redaction if you needed to, apply symbols on top of it with the count measurement if I really wanted to. And my favorite ones are the last four because they give us the most flexibility. I can actually just place a highlight very quickly on top of every single storage. And now that I've done that, if I click on a storage while my markups list is open, every storage is now part of the markups list. It's considered a highlight, but I can use the subject and change that and organize it differently. So I can use the subject and call it storage. It doesn't have to be highlight. So if I go to properties, I can change that right here. I can now double click on in the comments area. Look at that, it already wrote the word storage for us in comments. That's quite nice. For visual search, it won't do that. It'll have an empty comment area. So you'll have to double click in the comments area and change it. So for example, I'm gonna call this storage one, or this is probably storage 253A right here. But let's just call it storage one for simplicity's sake. And then we can change this one to storage two, et cetera, et cetera. So this is how we can use the visual search tool to now populate our quantities in our markups list and then start to organize those quantities properly. And this is where the markups list can really help you make quantity takeoffs very, very quickly. Now let's look at visual search. Let me get rid of these storages first, these little highlights. And visual search is really magical because you know text search is cool. We know that we've been able to do that in Microsoft Word for a long time, but visual search is amazing. So it's the second tab right up here, and we need to now use the get rectangle option to now choose what symbol or lines we're going to use. So I could do it, for example, on this sink right here. This is a really nice example. Now, you might have already noticed, but we have a few sinks in this restroom, and these are not rotated in the same direction. But that doesn't matter because we can search for multiple rotations, and I'll show you how that works. So I'm making my rectangle. A little bit of white space is good to have around the object. You don't want to draw from the edge of the object to the other edge because you, it might miss the actual borderline, which is a bad thing. So a little bit of white space is good. Review detects that and says, oh, it's negative space, no problem. Our sensitivity bar is very important. We want it to be set relatively low most of the time because if we have grid lines or other lines interfering with our objects, such as these grid lines here, and these are interfering in different ways, this is going halfway through, this is going all the way through, the other two sinks here have the same concern. So what do we do? Because now these are technically different objects if they have different lines in them. Luckily, review will detect most of the lines here and it'll say, oh, it's close enough, don't worry about it. So as long as you set your sensitivity low, it'll probably pick up on the other sinks, no problem. We can search for multiple rotations. We could search markups, but I'm not going to. I'm going to check that off. And now I'm just going to click on search right here. And I'm going to make sure I search just this floor plan. I could search other pages in the document. I could search on multiple documents here by using all open documents. It's really nice. So let's click on search. The results are populating down here. They're going to populate a little bit slower this time. but they're gonna come up soon because there's about five results found in one document, very nice. And here we can see them, the same issue occurs as I click on them in the actual list. It doesn't really show me exactly where they are, but at least they're, I know that they're on my screen and they're highlighted in blue, so that's not bad. Let's now select them all, click on the check options button, and now I can give them a highlight or a hyperlink. So if anybody wants to go to the shop drawing for the sinks, just click on a sink and you can go there immediately. It's pretty cool. Uh, let's turn these into a hyperlink. Why not? I think I'll demonstrate that in the last couple minutes of our webinar today because we have a couple minutes left until Q&A. So this is the hyperlink dialog and it's quite nice. What we can do here is we can choose to jump to a specific page on a specific floor plan. So any open floor plans will be in this drop down. I can go to page five, for example. I can even choose a specific place on a specific page. So I already have certain areas that I was testing uh, in other different training that I've done. If I click on create, it now will ask me what this place is going to be called. So I'm gonna call it QT webinar, just for today's webinar. And then what I can do is I can go to snapshot view and I can click on get rectangle. Now I can go to a specific page on my drawings. You'll notice that I have a plus sign for my cursor. So I don't have to be on this page. So let's go to that page five that we were talking about. I believe it's this one. Uh, actually, we'll go to the page six, even better. And let's zoom in on this ship two area. So I'm gonna make a nice box around this. So we wanna go exactly to this portion of the page and no other place. There it is, we've got some fun coordinates that are associated with that. So we're gonna click on okay. And there it is, we now have a new place that we can go to and use over and over again, just like these other places that I was using in other training. And if we wanted to, this is the hyperlink area, so I can put a website here if I wanted to, or a PDF that's online, for example, or a Google Docs sheet, 
There's all different things. I could even open a file if I click there. So I can open a specific file if I click on a specific object through this open dialog. It's really, really neat. So let's just do the first option, jump to a place on page uh, on a specific page. This page doesn't matter anymore up here. These are two separate options. I'm going to click OK. And now let's go back to our first page. Let's go to one of our sinks. Look at that. What I've done is I've actually turned my highlights themselves into red backgrounds. To access a highlight, you can right click on top of it and then go to properties. And you'll see that the highlight itself, or the hyperlink, excuse me, not the highlight, um, you can change its color. So what I've done is I've actually given it a fill style so that we can see the highlights. Usually highlights are not really visible. So for example, if I made it solid and I said white, then you wouldn't even know the highlight is there. Actually, it's covering some of the sink. That's kind of cool. Uh, I'll right click on top of it. I'm going to change it back to red and I'm going to give it the fill so that we can see the entire thing. Or I could leave it like this. So this uh, style is actually quite nice too. So now I can just click on any of these things. It doesn't matter which one. And there it is. We just went to that same section that I made the box around. So that's how hyperlinks work. And that's how we can allow our quantities to take us to certain things if they're on our page. And I believe that concludes our webinar. So if anybody has any questions, I would love to hear them. All right. Sounds good. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button here. Um, all right. We did have a couple of questions that came in here. Uh, if anybody else does have any other questions about anything we've discussed on the webinar or, or in the world of Bluebeam, please do go ahead and send that over uh, through the chat box. So, uh, Ari, the first question we got here, my column list is missing columns. How do I show them? Okay. I think I know what's happening. I talked a little bit about this, and what I think is happening is that if we go to our markups list down here, you can see that I have certain columns here. I have quite a few, but not as many that are possible in the program. Now, I think what you're saying is that if you go to the columns list dropdown or the markups list dropdown, and then you mouse over columns, you might be wondering why you have certain columns here, and let's say that you check them all on, but then you might think, hey, wait, aren't I missing certain columns that are not here? Aren't there more than this? And the answer is yes. So this list here is showing what columns are currently uh, in your profile that are in that are being used in your program, and you can toggle between them quickly here. To see all possible columns that are offered in the program, you want to click on Manage Columns. And in this columns list, this shows everything. And the columns that are actually not visible in that quick turn off, toggle on, toggle off list are these right here that are not checked. So Let's, let's actually use one of these as an example. So here's slope. It's not checked on. And then here's height. I'm going to turn on height. I'm going to leave slope off. And let's see if height appears in that new list. So we'll click OK. Then we'll go to our markups list dropdown, mouse over columns. And height is right here. We can now turn it on or off. But if we look in this list, slope is not even an option. So that's why you might be missing some columns. So now you know that you can see what I, we can actually give it a nickname. We can call this the master column list. And this is where you can turn them on or off, just like the master filter button. And then we have our column list specifically for this uh, page, for this profile that we're using, for this document, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that answers your question. Let me know if it doesn't, and you can always contact me. All right, perfect. Thank you, Ari. Uh, next one that came in here, uh, I would like to know where I can activate the takeoff cost. I missed that explanation. Is that something that you can show us real quick? If not, remember, we will be sending out the video uh, after the presentation. Yeah, I don't mind. I'll show it again. It's actually the most important part of this webinar. So what I did was, you'll see in my markups list down here, if I scroll to the right, I have my column turned on. So I've already made the list. Let me show you quickly how I made them. You go to the markups list drop down, mouse over columns, and click on manage columns. Then we go to custom columns. Here are the two columns that I made. I didn't show you how to make one from scratch, so that is a good question. All you need to do is click on add. You'll see that same dialog that we saw earlier. So for example, I can just call this QT test. I'm going to change its type to formula. And then I can use my expression. Now what I did earlier is I also made a materials column. So you'll want to make your materials column first. This one, I should, like I showed you guys, you just have your materials ready, make it a choice column, add your choices here. You can just click on add, give it a name, give it a subject. You can use subjects to categorize your items, for example. And then let me go and make another column again, QT test. 
we'll make this a formula, then you can type your expression here. Now that we have the material column, we can just type the letter M. Now we have all of our variables here, so we can double click on material in this list, space, and then use the star symbol right above the letter H to do multiplication, space again, and then type in any letter if you don't remember exactly what variable you're looking for. In this case, if I want to do a cost analysis for area, I would choose area. If I want to do the wall area, it's already there conveniently. If I want to do something more specific, I have all these different variables like height, length, width, etc. I'll let you guys experiment with that in your own uh, cost analysis. And that's it. I, hopefully that answers your question. And if not, we have the recording, like Alan said, and you can always call us if you're getting stuck and we'll help you out. Absolutely. Uh, I did have another one come in here that was a, a couple different parts. So let's start with the first part. Uh, can you show how, uh, how the hyperlink would work for another file? For instance, if I click on a markup um, and I want it to take me to a separate file, let's say a photograph, would that work? Yeah, that's great. Let's do it. Um, so we're going to take one of these markups I have here. We'll just take this one, for example. Right click on top of it. Uh, let me see, is hyperlink available here? No, it's not. That's okay. Let's actually do it. Now, Would you, if you want it for a markup, that's one thing. But if you want it for an object on your sheet, I showed you guys how to do that through the visual search if you wanted to. Instead of visual search, there is another way. You could use a snapshot. Let's actually use the hyperlink tool this time, and I'll show you how that works. So you can't hyperlink directly on a markup itself, but you can make a hyperlink on top of it or around it. So here's the hyperlink button. And then you can basically make a box around this. So whenever somebody clicks in this area, it's going to take you where you need to go. Then we're going to open a specific file. Let's see what example I use. I will browse through my PC on my other screen because of privacy reasons. <laughs> but that's okay. I'll look for a, a quick photo. I think I have one right around here. Let me just check. Uh, no, not that one. Oh, yes, right under flyer assets. There we are. So I'll use this image as an example. So there, I just clicked on open. Now you can see that the image that I chose is written in this list. That's quite nice. It even shows most of the file path. Now I'm going to click OK. And let's test it. Ooh, my hyperlink is blocking the markup. No problem. I'm just going to right click on top of the hyperlink. And I'm going to go to my properties. I'm going to turn my fill back to solid and turn that to uh, white. I believe that'll work. Very nice. There it is. So now you can see that the pointer, my cursor is changing to the pointer finger, so I know there's a hyperlink here. If it's, there's no hyperlink, you'll see that my cursor is only changing to the black cursor with the four cardinal directions icon to the bottom right of it. So this has a hyperlink, this one does not. If I click on it, oh, it did it on my other screen, but don't worry, you can, you can see it, there's the image. Let me see if I keep that here and I close it, maybe it'll open on this screen for you guys. Yes, it does, there it is. So that's how you do it, so easy. You can just basically create a hyperlink anywhere. If you need to modify your hyperlink, like I said, just right click on top of it and then click in the properties area just to uh, deselect your hyper, your right click, but you're still selecting the hyperlink itself. It's kind of weird how that works because if you click the hyperlink, it defeats the purpose, of course. <laughs> um, and there, and you can change all that here. Um, and if you need to edit the hyperlink further, there's the edit button right there. And there it is. So if you need to change your image, you can just click on this icon. You even have a drop down here that allows you to choose between files and folders. So yeah, very, very flexible. Hyperlinking is so cool. Great question. Uh, okay, perfect. And the second part to that question, can I export the entire file with the hyperlink to a folder? So. Yes, of course. Um, now, when you save a file and you go back into the file, the hyperlink is now stuck to your PDF. So here, I'll just save this. And then I'll close out of it quickly, go to my file access and open it really quickly right here. And there, the hyperlink is still there. I can tell because my cursor is there. It even, when I mouse over it, it shows the hyperlink um, file path right here in this text. So it all saves. And that's basically all you need to do. Just share this PDF with someone and the hyperlink will work. Now, here's the issue. If you share a PDF with someone and now you're linking to a file that's physically found on your PC, then that's not going to work because it won't know where to look for that file. If you're linking to a specific folder, um, you, it should work if you're using a cloud-based server, if you're using something that, like a server that everybody has access to, for example, our in internal server here in our office, we have a server here that we can just you know, drop files in and pick files up from. And more than likely, you should be able to hyperlink to a, a file on a server that everybody has access to. And if you share that file with other people, the link to that hyperlink should still work because it should have the same file path. 
If you move the file, the hyperlink will be broken, so be careful when you do that. Uh, but yeah, you can still hyperlink to other files, um, and you don't really need to export. Exporting is actually a thing. I'll explain what that means. If I go to the file dropdown and mouse over export right here, I can change my actual file type. So when you said export, I just wanted to confirm what you were talking about. Um, so if you want to leave it as a PDF, then just save your file and give it to somebody as a PDF. If you want to turn your file into another file, that's fine. But then you might lose your hyperlinks, so be careful. Because if you make it an image, for example, a JPEG, then it might get a little funky. So leave it as a PDF. Uh, maybe Word documents and Excel workbooks might keep the hyperlinks. Uh, some of these options might keep it. So, yep, just a couple tips. Good question, though. Very good question. And there's actually a follow-up, which is if there is an option to share with somebody outside the organization and have the hyperlink still work, which um, you know would be similar to what Ari was saying, I think. But but ideally, you'd want to put those files inside of a folder, for example. Uh, where that PDF is and, and share that whole folder essentially to retain those connections. That's exactly right, Alan. Yes, you would want to actually send them the folder with pictures and other things and the PDF. More, you know, it would be easier if it's in the same folder, but it could be folders within folders as long as you give all the folders. Exactly. Alan, you hit the nail on the head. All right. And uh, see if anything else has come in here. I think that's it. So, um, Ari, can I have you go over to that next slide for us? All right, well, thank you all for being here today uh, and attending our quantity takeoffs with Bluebeam Review webinar. And, um, you know, just a couple things to close with. Our blog is live. We've been, you know, talking about this for a little while now, but definitely do go ahead and check that out. That's the link right there. And you can actually get there from our website as well, from the, uh, from the header uh, menu. Uh, Bluebeam training is available and you know can definitely contact us for more information on that and you can actually see the dates for upcoming webinars both at the bottom of our homepage and on the events page on our website. Uh, and again for more information please reach out to us at info at ddscad.com or give us a call at 305-445-6480. All right thank you so much Ari and thank you all for being here and uh, look out for that recording coming your way very soon. Thank you Alan. Thank you everybody. Take care.